weighing in at 169 pounds, 12.1 stone, fighting out of Nottingham United Kingdom, Dan, the Outlaw Hardy! Hello and welcome to another open mat. We are joined by a very special guest, uh, MMA pioneer, uh, one of the best commentators in the business. Uh, and now moving on to the world of matchmaking mm. and uh, looking after Europe massively. Uh, so we are joined by Dan the Outlaw Hardy. How are you doing, my friend? I'm really good, man. Really good. Good to be joined by you guys. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll kick right, right in it. So we're in Scotland. First time PFLs came here. Yep. Hydro, huge, yep. huge venue for it. Uh, you've got Stevie Ray. You've got Robert Whiteford, two UFC uh, Scottish legends. What, what's it what's it like setting up to kind of move into Scotland and open up new doors because that's that's what you're ultimately you're doing you've obviously been in Europe uh, I'm excited to see you in Scotland yeah I mean to be honest it's it's it just made sense to come to come here. Like the the UFC fans have always been incredible up here. It's been a while since since there's been a big show in Scotland, mm. and I just I just kind of felt you know you feel the temperature of the area and you're like an MMA show would go really well here. And then when you've you know you've got the likes of Rob White and Stevie Ray who really want to be fighting on home soil. You know Stevie Ray's right towards the end of his career may hang him up. You don't know whether he's going to have one more fight or not. So it's like. The way that I've structured this card is we've got the two guys at the top of the card. They're the veterans. They're the, the old school, the guys that have been holding it down and flying the flag for you guys for a long, long time. And they're matched up against equally, uh, um, you know, s s you know, elder statesmen of the sport. Lou Long on one side, obviously from Wales, has got mm -hmm. an a, a, a incredible amount of experience, a great grappler. And then Roger Huerta, who was one of my favorite fighters back in the day. I, I remember watching him. Clay Guida, Alberto Crane, you know, he was the first guy that was looking up at the screens to see where his opponent was to elbow him in the mm. face. You know what I mean? Like, like there were so many moments that in Roger Huerta's career that I thought to myself, that guy's just a few steps ahead of everybody else. You know what I mean? And he's, he's had a very interesting roller coaster of a, of a life since that point. And he's just desperate to get back in there. So th for me, that's one of the most exciting fights on the card because I feel like Whiteford and Hurts, they both bring it every time, evenly matched fight. And then obviously we've got the playoffs underneath that. So it's like we've got two generations of Scottish MMA and then we've got the PFL playoffs right in the middle. And then, you know, next year we're going to have Scottish fighters in the, the playoff brackets as well. I love the fact that you're actually matching these guys up properly. And I'm not uh, insulting any other organisations, but sometimes when guys are coming to the end of their career, they're getting fed to the wolves. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. like, that doesn't, that doesn't do well for mixed martial arts. So I like the fact that PFLs came to Scotland, they've gave the guys not favourable fights, they're definitely not by any means going to get the nod in the win, mm -hmm. but it's, not it's, it's, yeah. it's very skill set matched up very, very well for the fans, and I like that. And then it leads us into that next thing where it's like, do you miss fighting? I, I imagine <sighs> you do. As a, as, a, as a student of the yeah. martial arts, I imagine you miss it. Would you be interested in a, not a gimme, but a, a matchup that's evenly matched? A hundred percent, you know, and this this is why I'm kind of maybe I'm 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 more sensitive to where these guys are in their career because, like, I recognise that even if I was you know able to get down to welterweight, which is probably a stretch now, I'm not going to be stepping in against anybody in the top ten, fifteen because it would just be a horrible day for me, right? But at the same time, I am still learning and I am still capable to an extent, you know, not compared to how I was when I was in my early twenties, but I still feel I've got that capability and I'm still learning and. You know what it's like, you learn a new jiu-jitsu technique, you can't wait to get to roll in to try it out, right? So I'm I'm going into the gym to try these things out, but then I don't have that next stage where I can try it against someone that's trying to murder me. You know what I mean? And that's really where the adrenaline connects for me. I've seen a few interviews where you, and the same person's name crops up every time. You keep saying Anthony Pettis. Yeah, I mean, we were kind of on a trajectory a little while ago. Like, Pettis, I've always had a lot of respect for Pettis. He comes from a great camp. He's got great coaches as well. So not only is it Anthony Pettis, but I'm taking on that whole camp if I'm fighting right, him, okay. right? You know, so like that, that for me would be, a, would be a real fun test because I've got some of the best minds in mixed martial arts trying to pull me apart, mm -hmm. which would really make me step up my game. But the other thing as well with Pettis is he's a fast striker. He's loose with his legs. Mm -hmm. You know, th these are things that were similar to me when I was, you know, younger in my career. I was Taekwondo background, lots of kicks, lots of dynamic striking. And for me, I just feel like that would be an evenly matched fight. He's, you know, 
still active, but not not on a streak anymore, you know, and mm -hmm. I've been out for, I don't know, 60 years or something. Uh, <laughs> and is there something there between you? Like, is it- No, nothing, like no. A, You just- I, he's, he's just- you know, He just- him. There's just a, there's a small selection of fighters that are kind of floating around, you know, like the likes of Cowboy mm -hmm. and uh, Nate Diaz, and you know even Dustin Poirier is going to be in that category in the next couple of fights. I think there's that there's that masters division, that veterans yeah. division, where like I don't want to see Nate Diaz fight Chimaev. I want to no. see Nate Diaz fight Tony Ferguson because that feels mm -hmm. like a fight that both of these guys can win, and I can enjoy it without feeling like I'm watching someone getting assassinated. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Exactly so, what you mean. Like, We've spoke about it a few times. It's, and you've just said it there, this kind of fed to the wolves where the, the young eat these old superstars. Yeah. And you think, oh, this, shouldn't, shouldn't be like, this guy was the guy. After. And there he's just, aye, I think so. Um, so with regards to this Masters division that you've mentioned, what about a guy like Jorge Masvidal? And now obviously he's trying to get back into the UFC, yeah. into fights with guys like Leon. Do you think that's being realistic at that? I, I think there's quite a big gap there. I think mm. somebody like Leon Edwards probably would make quite short work of Jorge Masvidal. Do you think Jorge Masvidal at this stage should be looking at more of that type of thing? Or, or in his head, is he still saying, no, I can mix it with guys like Leon Edwards? I think the thing is, the thing is when, when you're a fighter like Masvidal, you, you always feel like no matter who you're up against, you're going to crack him with that one shot that's going to change mm -hmm. the fight and make a difference, right? We also saw Nate Diaz land that shot on Leon and take his legs away, right? So mm -hmm. if I'm... If I'm Masvidal, I'm thinking I could probably I could probably connect with that shot. Mm -hmm. And then you go back to Masvidal fighting Till, and everyone was like, "Well, Till's going to smash him because he's bigger and younger and stronger, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Mm -hmm. But Masvidal's wisdom showed through in that fight. And and if you if you take Masvidal and you put him into a welterweight fight with a well-known British fighter, I feel like Leon's more forgiving of people generally when he fights them than Till would be. You mean less ruthless? Yeah. When you say like, more like look at Cowboy as a common opponent for both of them, right? Mm -hmm. For me, I feel like Leon almost carried him through that fight. I feel like he could have stepped mm -hmm. up if he needed to, whereas Till, Finish he it. wasn't letting him breathe. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a different kind of a different kind of opponent. So if I'm Masvidal, I'm looking at Leon, thinking I could probably get. 15 or 25 minutes out of this in a kickboxing match and in that time I feel confident I could land my skills like Masvidal's weird because he's like similar with Poirier he, he kind of blurs the lines because he is veteran and he is masters but mm -hmm. at the same time he's still competitive with some of the top 15 mm -hmm. you know what I mean so Absolutely, like yeah. I, I would say maybe two more three more fights for Masvidal and then he falls into the old boys category a, with the it, rest of us I love this idea of the masters and you're probably the first person I've ever seen address it realistically and I just think that there probably would be a huge appetite for that. And it also stops, it's the sort of conveyor belt of stars, isn't it? Like mm. you drop off and the new guy comes on and this, and, and I think that we should be able to enjoy these guys fighting for as long as possible. And I don't know what certain people's financial ability is, but there's probably some people are not making good investments with their money. We should be giving them the chance to keep making money for as long as possible. You don't want a guy getting, going, oh, I've, done nothing yeah <laughs> I've, like, I've not put in at the side and now i've not got a chance to make any more money yeah. you know you should still be able to have these that's just a that's just what i think yeah. I, I enjoyed that i mean I'm, I'm looking at it way more from a from a fan's perspective mm -hmm. of like well like i want to see these guys have another three or four fights but if we give them this one fight we're not going to see these other three or four fights right because they are entertaining people exactly this is it and, and you're invested in the person like tony ferguson i'm i love watching tony ferguson right. it's horrible what's happening but that's but I love as watching you say, the old, hey, the I'll, old eaten by the young. And I know yeah. that's a horrible Look, I, I, I get it. Like this is the process mm. of combat sports, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to use the, the the older names, the the elder statesmen, to build up the younger generation. I, um, my first real realization of this in mixed martial arts was Rich Franklin, mm -hmm. right? Rich Franklin was on a trajectory to fight for the world title, and no one really knew who he was, mm -hmm. right? He, he was he was he looked like Jim Carrey, he was a mass teacher and he wore brown and pink shorts. Like they were the main three things that people remembered about Rich Franklin. When the UFC realized that he was on that trajectory to get to the belt, they knew they needed to put something in, someone in front of him that would recruit the old fans into his journey. So they dusted Ken Shamrock off and brought him mm -hmm. out of retirement. And that was one of those circumstances where 
like it was obvious what they were doing. They were trying to tee Rich Franklin up to be the known fighter yeah. stepping into the championship fight. Mm -hmm. Like those kind of things make sense, absolutely. And a guy like Ken Shamrock's going to come in and cash in and, and you know, take that opportunity. But the guys that want to keep competing and are not on a trajectory to a, to a belt and do just want to be active and keep having fun fights. It's the same with football, right? Masters divisions and football. I remember mm -hmm. my dad going to watch Stuart Pearce when he was in his mid 40s because we remembered when he was playing for Nottingham yep. Forest. And it's not like he's gonna get buried because he's playing against 18 year olds right. that are running circles. You can go and enjoy these guys and their skills and their career and not expect the heights of their peak condition out of them anymore. You know? mm -hmm. So you alluded to Stevie Ray and Robert Whiteford being near the end of their careers in the matchmaking you've had to do for PFL Glasgow. So say, they, say this is the last kind of one or two more fights. Who's the next Scottish star that you see on this card that you would look to one day be headlining at the Hydro or anywhere for that matter? Man, I, I think, honestly, I think Scottish MMA is stronger than it's ever been right now. And I think, you know, if you look at, well, this card particularly, we've got uh, Gemma Old, Lorenzo Parente, Brian Hislop at the bottom of the card. And I've moved Mark Ewan up to the top of the card. He's probably the next big star, I think, Mark Ewan. Just we, purely because... We spoke with him last week. Is that right? So, yeah. Uh, sorry, I've cut in there. No, no, you're good. I, I just, I, he's, he's, got, he's got what's necessary, right? He's got... He's got the, the skill and athleticism. He's got the determination and dedication. He's also got the resilience to come back from that loss in Newcastle yep. and put himself into another tough fight and, and feel confident he's going to come out on top and win. Like, I'm very invested in Mark Ewing's career, and I know a lot of other people are as well. But that also, you know, that also leads me on to the other people in that camp that he's training with. Like, Lorenzo Parente is, is a real talent. Kunle Lawal, another guy that's incredibly talented. Like, I feel like this generation is going to take Scottish MMA to a whole new level. Mm, we, we feel, yeah. obviously, we train with these guys, so mm. we're maybe a little bit biased. It's nice mm. to hear it from someone who's... Uh, we've seen them, we see them in and out, day in, day out. We see them every day, mm. but this and is... we've seen the development of these guys for being mm -hmm. young guys. And when you think about Mark, when he's telling us he's only 25, and you're like... Wow. <laughs> like when I was, I didn't start this sport until I was 24. Mm. Like I had never ever been involved in combat sport. And the next generation of guys are starting so much younger. And the skill development is so much greater than it ever was. Mm. Looking back, would you, if you could rewind time and let's say I can take an extra 20 years off your life, would you do anything different? Would you like to have a shot at the UFC 20 years ago with the skill set you've still got? I, I, honestly, I think this, I, I don't think I don't think the sport has moved on tremendously as far mm. as skills go. I, I do feel like there were deficits in my game that aren't there now, for sure. So I can look back at my old fights and go, "Man, why did I do that? That was a stupid decision. I didn't have those techniques at that point." So I can certainly see areas where technically I could be better if if I was in the sport now. I have a better understanding of the sport generally. It feels way less overwhelming than it did when I was in my early twenties. Mm. I felt like. I felt like no matter how much time I spent in the gym, I was never going to be able to learn everything. And my mentality was that I needed to learn everything, mm -hmm. right? And it was, there was panic associated with that. Yep. So like now I'm far more streamlined in the way that I'm thinking, the way that I'm training. But what I will say is I feel like, I feel like my, my, my personality in the sport in 2010 would have done really well in the sport in 2024, just purely because, you know, I was... I was Brush. outspoken and I was trying to annoy people and I had a silly haircut and you know what I mean? Like there were lots of things that I did that I think would have, would have resonated well with the fans of today. Um, so that's the only thing. And it's interestingly similar to Roger Huerta, you know what I mean? Like if he was a star in the UFC now, he would have, he was the first guy on Sports Illustrated and he was like a super good looking guy and a yep. Mexican banger, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like his fame now, if he was in the UFC, would be so much greater just because the, the sport's much bigger. It's, it's developed so much yeah. more for when I put on gloves to even when you put on gloves, it's, it's I, I call it a stone age when, when you put on <laughs> gloves. There wasn't a path. You didn't have a no. path to follow, and it was, you were like, uh, I read your book like when it first came out, and it was like, I remember reading all about all the fights, you were trying to fight every weekend, yeah, and you were just trying to put yourself up against somebody better than you, or, or not that you thought they were better than you, just somebody that you would got you excited, exactly. got you enough to go in there and, and go and put on a performance. Here's another question, because I feel it now as I get older, you're talking about uh, your what you were like back then with the Mohawk, with the winding up fighters and getting them to bite. 
do you think you'd still be using that same technique right now, like as we are the now? So we get to fight in a Masters, you're up against Tony Ferguson, you're up against Anthony Pettis. <laughs> are you going in there with still the same, still the same brash attitude and trying to get that rise out of him? I think so, yeah. I think so. I mean, it was always... Sometimes when see, when someone sees you do something well and they see you do it one time, like when I fought Marcus Davis and I just I was on his case like the whole time because he was biting to everything. Mm-hmm. Coming out of that fight and going into the Mike Swick one, I knew that Swick wasn't going to bite. Like he was expecting the trash talk. He was excited mm-hmm. for it, so I didn't do any. Right? You know what I mean? Like sometimes so you have to your switch approach gears. Yeah. For specific it would depend guys. on the opponent. Was Davis was the you were calling him a fake Irish, was, oh, was yeah. that one? He was the Irish hand grenade. I, you, you, yeah. get, you, get him, yeah. you get him you got him you got him biting. I did. And, and it worked into your game plan because he did try and come out and take your head off and it worked yeah. absolutely perfectly for you. But more than anything with that, I wanted to railroad him into knowing what he was gonna do. Like mm. there were two versions of Davis that would show up. He'd either show up like stacked and full of muscles and he would come to grapple, mm-hmm. or he would look lean and sharp and fast and he would be coming to box. Like if you watch him fight Jason Tan or Jess Leodon, you could see the boxer version of him. And that guy was way more difficult to deal with because he was quick and he put his pun- punches together. If I could force him into wanting to grapple with me, I could deal with that version of him better. Mm-hmm. If that made sense. Oh, totally, so that yeah. was my game plan. And just the fact that he got so angry became the, the biggest narrative going into that fight. You know, like, like in between rounds, it wasn't, if you do this, you'll beat him. It was, if you do this, you'll shut him up. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm way in his head. <laughs> I read a little passage in Bisbing's book and he was talking about he first met you for, I'm sure it was Ultimate Fighter Trials. And he said you were quite a quiet, reserved, philosophical type of guy. Mm-hmm. So, was, so was this sort of more aggressive, brash Dan Hardy, someone you had to cultivate? Or was he always in there and came out at fight time? Or were you, because of this sort of, like, he, like Bisbing said, philosophical side, you were able to keep that under wraps until you needed it. I just, I think I've always, they're just different facets of, of my personality. Like I, I am a quiet person. I was mm-hmm. a quiet kid. You know, we, I'm sure we're going to talk about Lego at some point. Yeah. Like my, my <coughs> whole childhood was me on my own playing with Lego or drawing, you know, like, and it, yeah, it's a different conversation for a different day, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere quite clearly on the autistic spectrum. Like yes. my mum looks after autistic children and she can look back at my childhood and she can say, I, I can see it quite clearly in you now. Mm-hmm. So 90% of my time, I'm quiet on my own, in my own head. But then when I step out and I'm in the light, there's a different part of my personality that comes out. So like the red mohawk and stuff, like I would have done that anyway. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, that had was, you not been fighting? I don't know, I would have still right. done it anyway, yeah. Would have just been part of you? Yeah. I, I like know, that though. Like even when I was a kid, when I was at, you know, when I was at, prior, at secondary school, you know, I, I had long hair and, you know, I was a, I was a heavy metal guy. I had yeah. nail varnish and black eyeliner and stuff. And I, I just did what I wanted because I wasn't really bothered about what other people thought. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just think that parlayed into a character that worked for MMA because... It was just like, well, this this punk rock part of my personality, I'm gonna crank that up and lean into it because that's where my strength is when it comes to fighting. Mm-hmm. Like the the roaring at the camera and stuff, that's all who I am, you know. Right. I'd do that if I was a heavy metal singer. It's the same kind of thing, but I'm not gonna do that in my kitchen at home. I'm not gonna be a maniac most of the time. But in the moments where I can be a maniac, that's where I'll let it out. So you're able to keep a lid on it, out with a fighting environment, because I think this is maybe where some guys do struggle. Yeah. Like some people, it does take over their personality a bit. They do become that person all the time and it starts to bleed into other parts of their life. And maybe that's where some people are, like you've gone on for fighting and had a pretty, like everybody still knows you, everybody hears like you're doing well after MMA. There's some guys maybe not doing so well because they've let this fighter version start seeping into other parts of their Mm. life and damaging it. Whereas you've obviously been able to separate and mm-hmm. keep it between that's me in the gym or that's me when I'm fighting. This is quiet, Dan. I'm doing interviews. I'm at PFL. I'm matchmaking. You've been able to separate the two. And that's something we speak about quite a lot. And we spoke about with Mark Ewan last week. Mm. Do you have this? Uh, he actually said, I see it as having, um, I said, do you think fighters, a lot of them have something missing? They're, they don't have something. He saw it as having something extra. I have an additional part that I'm able to tap into. And I think that was what we were most, it's like you said there about Mark. I see him in the gym all the time, but it, a lot of times there's not, because there's quite a big weight difference between me and him, it's a sort of, hi, how's it going? See you later at the end of the session. And I was just learning about him with that interview as well. 
And he said something that I've not really stopped thinking about since we spoke to him. He said, the person that goes into the cage is that little boy who was troubled when you were younger. So it's interesting that you mentioned, I'm going off on a tangent here, but it's interesting you mentioned the autism thing and how there seems to be such a common theme with fighters. Yeah. And we had also said this, are we going to keep seeing this in fighter mm. interviews? And it is a recurring thing now. I think we've pretty much seen with all the fighters we've spoke to, every single one of us is saying, Mm, there was just a little bit of something that made me pursue this path. Yeah. So I, th I think there's I think there's a there's a, a sanctuary in a career like this mm -hmm. for for people that are on on you know neurodivergent in any way, because you can you can manage your environments better, right? Like if I was in training camp, I knew that I was going to be out amongst people for about four hours a day. The rest of the time, I'm on my own. I'm building Lego. I'm watching Big Lebowski. I'm listening to music. I'm just I'm I'm on my own. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I get to charge that part of my personality, my person up, so I can go back into a gym and be in a intense environment. But and it's it's an interesting point that you make because um, and if we use Conor McGregor as an example, when Conor was coming up, he was everyone expected him to be Conor when they met him, right? Mm -hmm. So. The more famous he got, the less time he had to be himself without being that character that's Connor. Now, I was only required to be myself in that character for a short period of time because MMA wasn't particularly very big. So when I go home, I'm back to being Daniel with mm -hmm. the Lego collection and you know what I mean? So I wasn't, I w it wasn't required of me to be in character so much that it took over. Mm -hmm. That's how it feels. Yeah. Like I feel that coming out of me sometimes. Like if I'm at a hockey game and I'm like some fans are yelling at one of my favorite players, I'm like I can feel it and I know it's there, but I know that's not the place for it. And I know that if I can feel that emotion coming out and I don't feel like I control it, that's the time for me to go and do a Lego set or cool off. Yeah, you know what I mean. Aye, it's, I do. It's, but it, but like a lot of this is 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 in hindsight is looking back at myself and seeing you know coping mechanisms, if you like, or like brief respites that I would find in their moments where I was like, okay, this is the time when I have to be on. I have to be in front of people. So a lot of people would think I'm quite an extroverted person and mm -hmm. I'm really not, I'm mm -hmm. really not. Um, but you get the extroverted person because I'm in extrovert environments yeah. like this where I'm talking to people. So I, that part of my personality comes out. Now, if, if I've been talking to you guys in this scenario all week, I'm a different version a week later because I'm like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I need to be in a quiet space. Like, leave me alone. I don't want eye contact. I don't want conversation. I don't want loud noises, loud smell. Uh, no, smell you know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. like I have a, I have a, uh, like a, like a, um, I have to like let my senses kind of die down a little bit. I'm sure you find the yeah, same thing. I'm exactly the same. You know I, hate what I, mean? I hate meeting people. I hate, <laughs> like, I get, <laughs> but I not because do we don't like anxiety. people. It's not, I, I get yeah. anxiety going to places yeah. because. I don't get to be myself, mm -hmm. as you're saying, that guy that plays Lego. I don't get to be him. Because yeah. when people meet you, they want you, as you said about the Conor McGregor, they want you to be Paul. And it's like, they I want call you with the blue, the the blue face. I and, call yeah. it the Bear Jew, and you probably call it the Outlaw. So yeah. it's like the Outlaw has to be out all the time. And you're like, I don't want to be this guy. Yeah. It's, like, it's hard being him, <laughs> and it's, it, it zaps energy. So, like, for a, an, an example, I went to a wedding and uh, it came to me maybe about half ten. I go to my bed ten o'clock every night. Love it. It's the best time in my like. Love it because then I get to recharge the batteries and get up and and do my normal life. Half ten at night, and I was like, I've had enough. Yeah. I'm, I'm fed up. People are like coming down and sitting next to me and want to talk to me. Yeah. And it's just overwhelming, and you never get to be yourself around your actual around everybody else. You get to be around your close friends and mm. family, but it's it's, it's difficult. It's very yeah. difficult. But, but even that, in Conor McGregor's case, becomes less and less. Like, he even would get to the stage where he goes around to his parents' house and they want him to be Conor McGregor. You know mm. what I mean? Like, they might have people coming around to visit the house and, like, Conor's coming around. And then he has to step into character yeah. all the time to the point where he can never... Especially when you're part of that big family as well. Yeah. yeah. I had that recently with you. I was fighting and I wanted Paul to corner me and I was genuinely nervous about asking him because I was like... It's going to be so busy. Fight shows are difficult. People yeah, are going to be 100%. up at twenty four seven. Like, how does he? And it, and I quite like it when it's just one cornerman. Just uh, we've spoke about this before, but I like just one person. Boom, nice, concise, clear instructions. Yeah. And I, I was genuinely like, what if he turns around and says no? Who will I ask? And then and then I was like, maybe I'll not ask him because it will. It is just such a, especially going to an MMA environment where of course everyone knows who yeah, he is. Yeah. So it's it's going to be constant, and it's probably similar. 
you're getting the same thing, stop for pictures and how's it going? And so I'm not at that stage, obviously, but I can see it being quite overwhelming. Yeah, like it can be. Aye. It can be. I have to be ready for it. Like yeah. the like the old I'll days, like up. yeah, for sure. Like International Fight Week, they were always like I remember staying at the Luxor in Vegas when they were doing the International Fight Week at Mandalay Bay, and I had people knocking on my door for me to sign stuff at the hotel. Like, because word got out through room service, what room I was in, and literally people mm -hmm. are showing up at my door, like, I'm like. Uh, how do you feel about that? Do you think that's. That for, that for, that's that over seems that's intrusive. Over, yeah. I think so. Yeah, I, for I, sure. I, but are you in a position where it's quite hard, and probably same for you, are you in a position where it's very hard to just go, buddy, that's a bit rude? Uh, of course, because, that's, <laughs> like, because that one person will, will tell another thousand people that story, mm -hmm. right? Like you were a, yeah, exactly. a, like a bad guy, and that's the last thing you want to be. No. Obviously, you want to be liked by fans, because this is an entertaining sport, and if people are, people are either going to back you one or the other mm. way, they back you because they like you, or they back you because they hate you, they want to see you get ma mashed up. And the last thing I wanted was to be a bad guy. And yeah. I imagine that's pretty much the same for yourself. I just, I just, I just wouldn't want to be disliked generally. I wouldn't yep. want to come across in a way that anyone would would feel like they need to dislike me, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not even even away from MMA, away from any kind of any kind of level of celebrity, which is a weird word to use. Like I just don't want to be a person that's unpleasant to be around mm -hmm. with other people. So this is another thing is like. This is why training camp suited me because I know I've got four hours a day where I have to be around people. I have to be a good version of myself. The rest of the time, I can charge myself back up in that time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it's like, if I don't get that, then I know that I'm going to be agitated and a bit more impatient. And I don't want to be that version of myself, even with my family, right? If I feel like I've had a long week, I won't go and see my parents because I'm like, I don't want to inflict myself upon them. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, and, and this is another thing where, and I'm sure you're going to find this even more as you do, as you speak to more more fighters. Like, there's, we're all on a spectrum somewhere, yep. pretty much, right? And 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 it's how you manage where you are on that spectrum and how MMA plays into that. I find very interesting. Like, you look at someone like Ryan Hall. He's, he's the way that his brain calculates jujitsu <laughs> is incredible. It's not the way that my brain works, but I can watch him and I can go, that is amazing. Mm -hmm. Or the guy that climbed El Capitan with no ropes. Alex, mm -hmm. whatever his name is. Same thing again. Like he looks at that and sees roots and paths and a plan in his head that I don't see. It's a, it's a, it's like a superpower that the brain has. Mm -hmm. And and when I see other people with it, I'm like, I understand why you came to mixed martial arts. You go to the mat on H at Henzo Gracie's, like. I would like say fifty percent like of the map. People, isn't it? Yeah, they're like they're so tuned in to the finer details. You know what I mean? And it's, it, I think MMA attracts those kind of people because it's so chaotic, but there are clear patterns through it yeah. that are difficult to see. It's funny you mentioned your mum spotting because my partner she does a similar job and she says to me all the time like I don't know how you've slipped through the net. Yeah, like you've just been. And then it wasn't that wasn't a thing. We were. I know. Up, there, it I wasn't even like you know, legal guys. <laughs> Miss, miss, you had you were behavior bad. issues. Mm -hmm. You had behavior bad, issues, and yeah. I, you, were, you were bad. You didn't want to learn, but it's and not like that. You we go do to the enjoy gym. learning. You go yeah. to the gym and meet these guys who are just like, like you. And you're like, oh no, it is, it is everyone. And now, uh, and doing these interviews as well, like I feel even better because I'm yeah. like, oh, it is. It's not just because you do feel a bit. Oh, maybe that. Maybe it is just me. Maybe I'm just a bit off. Mm. But isn't it like even yourself to be so open about that? The other thing is. Um, the use of psychedelics. Mm. You're a fan of this. Absolutely. So I'll go straight to the main question I've been using for it. Do you worry about it softening you if you're still wishing to compete in MMA? I, I did when I first, my first trip to Peru, I did. Uh, you've went the full this ayahuasca, ayahuasca route. Mm. Yeah, my first, I never had that feeling with anything else any like psilocybin or anything like that. I never had that feeling. That always felt like it was a, it was a part of me connecting with, with, with the core of who I am, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I would often get to, especially with, with psilocybin, I would be able to get to a space where I would go through the deepest part of the journey and I would come out of the other side and I would be alert and aware, but I would, I would spend hours just staring into my own eyes in the mirror because like in the blackness of my eyes, I can see the person that steps in the cage. Mm -hmm. And I know that's an odd thing to say, but it's like, that's the only time I can recognize myself in that state mm -hmm. is if I look right directly into the, into the black of my eyes. The rest of me looks, looks like a shell. And, and it's and like, so with psilocybin, it was always, I was always getting closer to connecting with myself. Mm -hmm. With ayahuasca, and I don't know whether it was because it was a trip to Peru and, and all that kind of thing, but there was a genuine concern that I was going to go out to Peru and come back and not want to fight anymore. But this was at the same time where I was on a four fight losing streak, right? So I'd, I'd lost four so fights in a row. So you've done this quite a while ago. This was obviously yeah, yeah. before it was, 
I didn't realise it was as long ago. I thought this was a more recent thing. No, this was I lit. I literally left to go to Peru from Vegas on the Monday after UFC two, uh, 146. So I was on a four fight losing streak. I was on 146 matched up against Dwayne Ludwig. Mm -hmm. And if I lost that, that was five fights in a row. So I was gonna be released. Right. There was no way around it. I came out of that training camp. I went to see Van Halen the next night at, at the MGM. And then the <laughs> next morning I was on my way to Peru. Shaved, shaved the mohawk off so I wasn't recognizable and that kind of thing. And, and whenever you're going into a, into a ceremony you're supposed to set intentions, right? You're supposed to like, mm. I, I want, I want a direction that I'm going to walk in with this. So my first, my first ayahuasca ceremony, my direction was, am I still a fighter? Like, do I still have it in me? Like, what is it that's driving me? Why do I want to do this? And do I still have it? Is it gone? Because you've got to remember, I booked this trip before the losing streak had come to an end. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know stepping out of the cage at Ludwig, uh, of the Ludwig fight, whether I was going to be coming off a win or a loss. Mm -hmm. So I just, I went out to Peru coming off a win, but still questioning whether that was just a flash in the pan mm -hmm. and I landed a good shot and whether I still had the, the minerals to, you know, to force myself through those, those circumstances. And I had, so the first, that first one, I had three ayahuasca and two San Pedro ceremonies, which is uh, mescaline, slightly different, do it in the daytime. And the three ayahuasca ceremonies were some of the most, the most life-changing experiences I've ever had for a lot of different reasons. Some of them, it was very uncomfortable at times. It was very painful at times, but the, the, the feeling coming out of it is I've still got this. It's still in me. I can still feel that fire in me. And, and it was like, I was like, I was drawing on parts of my personality to recruit that strength back into me, to rebuild my confidence, to continue fighting. Um, but like, they've all been, I've had lots and lots of different, I mean, probably with, with psilocybin, I've probably had, I don't know, I would say maybe two or 300 ceremonies. Whereas ayahuasca, I've had ayahuasca 14 times now. And what made you, so were you, like were you just taking mushrooms and then went, I need to start moving this up a gear? Or did you look into psilocybin, you looked into ayahuasca and then you just thought, nah, I'm just gonna make the jump straight to that. Was there a build up to it? It was, it was, it was kind of going through the, the process of, of psychedelics and understanding that there's like a family of psychedelics, mm -hmm. right? The obvious, the, the obvious one, the easiest one was, was psilocybin, mushrooms, right? Mm -hmm. Mushrooms and truffles, because they're native to Europe, like they, they were much easier accessible a few years ago as well. But like, and, and, and because like I had an apartment in Nottingham, so I had a nice quiet space that was all mine and I would have a ceremony m almost every weekend but it would be the, a process of the whole weekend. I would train Saturday morning, I would go home, I would clean the house, I would meditate, I would go through this, this process of fasting and preparing myself for it. And then that would be my Saturday night. I'd wake up Sunday morning and rest and I'd do a run on Sunday and then back to work on Monday. And that became almost like routine in training camp. Mm -hmm. And that, that time on the Saturday night was my, my reset ready for the next week. I came out feeling super charged up, almost like a, like a, like a wild animal at times. You know, and then when I was in Vegas, I would do I would do the same pattern ceremony on a Saturday night. But then I would wake up on Sunday morning still with, you know, sort of three and a half grams worth of the psilocybin kicking around in my system and then go out and do trail running. Mm -hmm. And if you read uh, Terence McKenna, he's got some fantastic books. Terence McKenna's the guy, Food of the Gods. He talks about how. And his theory is uh, Joe Rogan calls it the stoned ape theory. I don't really like that. I think it kind of plays it down a little bit. Terence McKenna's theory is that psilocybin was, was responsible for brain growth, mm -hmm. right, in our evolution. And the reason why the, the mammals, the, the humanoids were eating psilocybin were surviving was because it improved their edge and depth perception, right? So if I'm on, if I'm on the plains of Africa and I'm foraging and these grubs and mushrooms and stuff, and I'm just kind of eating what I can because the canopies died down and the rainforests have died off. And now I've, I've, I've had to become a ground dwelling, uh, you know, forager instead of a canopy dwelling fruit eater. Now I'm finding new things to integrate into my, into my diet. Mm -hmm. And at some point truffles, mushrooms, they would have become a part of that diet. And the, the, the humanoids, the humans that were, that were ingesting those things would have had an advantage in hunting and surviving. And I used to tap into this when I was doing my trail running. That's why I would go trail running on a Sunday because I would drive out into, into the hills in Vegas and I would go belting down this path in my Vibram. So I'm fully connected with the floor. And 
I just felt like my eyes was, were, it was picking up on everything so much quicker. I was able to move and think so much quicker. So like those moments, it was like a running meditation. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like this, this wild animal galloping through, the, galloping through the mountains in Vegas, you know what I mean? And this was part of my, my power going into the fights. Is there still something you do? Yeah, Aye? absolutely. How often? Uh, not nearly as much anymore, just just purely because I'm so busy and uh, uh, you know I'm I'm all over the place. But um, but you do see it as a <clears throat> excuse me. You see it as a helpful. It's a medicine. A medicine. It is a medicine. Mm -hmm. One hundred percent. Like there's another another really good book written by Brian Marescu, uh, uh, Immortality Key, and it talks about how psilocybin mushrooms were integrated into our culture around the world, mixed with wine, mixed with honey. You know, it's mm -hmm. been a, it's been a very integral part of our growth, and obviously with the and this is, we're going off onto real tangents here, but with the, oh, with the emergence of, of, you know, like organized religions, they pride all this stuff away from us. Like mm -hmm. go to the church for the connection with God. Mm -hmm. Don't go into the forest for the connection mm -hmm. with God. The woman who lives on the outside of the forest, she's a witch, don't talk to her. That's get you away from paganism exactly. and stuff, yeah. eh? I so have, like, a young, you know, I have a young friend of mine, he's only, he's early 20s, and I was, he, he has a little mushroom tea before sparring mm -hmm. and says it helps him. And I was talking to you in the group yep. chat about it last night. I was like... But listening to you talk about the depth perception, because that was one of the things we'd said. That's like, what just made me think about it there. I was like... And he's, he's have like, you ever used it going into a fight? Not in the fight. I have sparred. I have sparred with it, though. How do you feel on it? Um, I, f I, find it's, I find it's a little bit more difficult to, f to focus myself on my techniques. If I believe my techniques and I believe in my, my preparation and I let it go, I feel much better. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I sometimes, because, because you don't want to be like, you don't want to have, have a lot in your system, yeah. you want just a small amount, you've still got that, the human element encroaching mm -hmm. into your mind where your mind's going, yeah, but if you do that, you might catch you with that. And you know what I mean? So I always found like, Things like outdoor, like running outdoors, where there's no nothing to do other than keep moving yeah. forward. It, it it allowed my brain to switch off and let me do it. Whereas when I've got something live in front of me that I have to I have to connect with, I always found there was a little bit of a battle there. I, I do know, and I won't say any names, but I know there are a lot of high level fighters that do microdose and do microdose through training camps and through fights. I know that for a fact, um, and. I can see how it affects those people positively, especially because some of the fighters that do it, they struggle psychologically. And I think a lot of people lean into it to help them with the psychology of the fight. Whereas for me, I always felt like it connected me to this kind of, this animalistic side of myself, mm. you know what I mean? And that's where I allow the animal to come out and just do its job, you know? Yeah. It's weird though that you say the human side pulling against you. It's like you're separating Dan Hardy using psilocybin and Dan Hardy. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense the way I've ordered that? Yeah. Like, you almost see yourself as holding yourself back and this is stopping you doing that. Yeah. Could that be, is that, have yeah, I picked that up correctly? Yeah, that I? sounds right. It, it's not too dissimilar to, like, if you listen to um, Eckhart Tolle when he's talking at the start of The Power of Now, he's talking about his observation of, I'm, I'm sick of myself. Well, I can't be sick of myself because that would mean that I'm, I'm two separate things, mm -hmm. right? I am a thing and then I am, I am the thing that is sick of that thing. Mm -hmm. And he was able to, I mean, reach enlightenment or whatever you want to call it by, by going through this process of realizing that he's not, he's not two separate entities, he is one thing. But we've still all got that part pulling on us, right? Mm -hmm. I've got two wolves on my chest, I've got a calm and an angry one, mm -hmm. right? We, 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 we know that yeah, saying, yeah, yeah. like, we've, you've, it, you, you're, gonna be, you're gonna be the wolf that you feed, but we're both the wolves, right? They're gonna mm -hmm. pull in different directions all the time. Like, my brain, it didn't show up as one unit it's evolved same as all of our brains they've evolved over many many years so like different stages of the brain developed at different points right so the reptilian brain is very very focused on you alone right if, if we're a group and we're out in the forest you don't give a damn about us mm -hmm. like it's you you'll kill us if it means one meal for you and we're irrelevant right that's the reptilian brain it's ruthless you're the priority then the old mammalian brain developed and this is when you as an individual realize that, well, if I've got food and you share your food with me, then I'll share my food with you. So it's like mm. this kind of mutual codependency. There's still not, not a lot of care there. It's kind of feigned care. It's still selfish in its root because, well, I'll share my food with you because tomorrow when you've got food, 
and my Your survival is still it's prioritized. Just, it's survival, but it's two different. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Two different parts. But it's like a negotiation of survival mm -hmm. there. It's like, well, I can I can allow you to survive because that will allow me to potentially survive for a bit longer. Yep. And then the new mammalian brain, which if we started off in our evolution with the new mammalian brain, we would have never have made it because my, my new mammalian brain will allow me to starve to death to make sure that you guys eat. Mm -hmm. Like that entirely altruistic so thing yeah. is not, it's the opposite of survival. Mm -hmm. And that's the pull, right? When I'm in a fight situation, I don't want to be thinking about whether my sister's upset because I'm getting punched in the face, right? I can't, I can't give that emotion there. I need to be entirely in the cage, mm -hmm. right? So that's why I need to tap into that, that uh, reptilian brain. Like my book's called Part Reptile, yep. right? And the gem, obviously. Yeah, well, the, see, see it, it's a bit confusing because like the brand and, and the channel and everything, that was full reptile. Mm -hmm. And that was a state that I was always trying to reach. And I always use other fighters as examples, Vandalay Silva, Robbie Lawler. They switch into that reptilian brain without even trying, mm -hmm. right? I would have a constant conflict in my mind when I was fighting. The moment where Dwayne Ludwig, Dwayne Ludwig hit me with a right hand at the start of that fight, two parts of my brain switched off. My old mammalian brain's like, we gotta survive here. Ignore what the new mammalian brain's saying. We don't care what's happening outside of the yeah. cage. And I'm up against him, up against the fence, holding on to him, realizing that my body's reacting and I'm not thinking about what I'm doing. And I'm like, now I'm kind of sitting back as like a passenger and my reptilian brain's just running the show. It's doing mm -hmm. exactly what I trained it to do through training camp. And now I'm not like an overseer making sure it's, it's working. I just sat back and allowed it to play out. And for me, I was always trying to get back to that place. Like, let me get back to that, that full reptile state where I see Vandalay Silver existing and looking like an absolute psychopath. And I see mm. Robbie Lawler with that, that dead great white shot look in his eyes. Like, I know he's full reptile because mm. he doesn't give a damn. He'll eat your face if he needs to to win this fight. <laughs> Absolutely. You don't understand what I'm saying? So it's like, like the cross chatter in me was, was the different parts of my brain having, this, having conversations with, mm. with each other. And then when I, when I would use psychedelics, I would be able to compartmentalize them a little bit. It would be a bit more like we're sitting around a table and I could listen to one and then the other and, and take on their opinions, but not take them as fact. Because our brain is going to contradict itself constantly. And mm -hmm. that's the real battle. And second guess. Yeah. Mm. My, my daughter came out with one I thought was quite interesting. She's only eight. So my son was watching my last fight on YouTube. And so he's 13, so he's big enough, I think. But my daughter came along and she went, ah, oh, it's funny that that's not the same dad in the house, eh? Mm. So she's spotted it's two people. Mm -hmm. And that's something I've always, but I've kind of felt awkward saying that out loud sometimes. Like it's two, the, the two people thing, or like you're alluding to with a, have you always spoke quite openly about this or? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just learning as I go, honestly. Right. I'm learning as I go. I think I'm at that point where I'm like, I need to tap into that guy. Mm. And talk, like dealing with psychedelics the more I want to get deeper into that, the more I want to bring him out. Mm. Because I feel like being a dad, being an older guy, this this reptile's getting like, no, no, you're, you're not needed anymore, but he's definitely needed. Yeah. And especially mm. when you're going up against, when you're fighting, he needs to come out. And that's something like, see, just listening, like I'm listening to you and I'm like, this is like what I'm going through right now. I'm going through this sort of second guessing myself. Like, am I going to be a fighter? I'm four losses. Have I made the right decisions in life? Where am I going? How am I going to do it? So listening to you talk about psilocybin and all this kind of stuff is like, check, check, mm. check. It's, 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 been, it's massively helped me just listening to you as a, as a, as a, as a fan mm. sitting here like just... We're clearly needing more openness on it though because there's a lot of guys... It, so in the last like three weeks, that's us spoken to three fighters and every single one is saying the same thing. Look, there's a problem here. I've tried this and it's kind of helped with it. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand what the, the stigma is around it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, obviously you were going to Peru quite a while ago. Was mm. there a stigma then? Like now it's, now it's almost seen as a big YouTube adventure, but back then it would have been dangerous probably yeah. to go to Peru. It was, it was <clears throat> people didn't really understand what I was doing at the time. Mm. Uh, you know, I think, I think ayahuasca has become far more of a, you know, a pop culture word these mm -hmm. days. Um, but then, you know, it all came out of like, you know, magic mushrooms and DMT and obviously Rogan talking a lot about dimethyltryptamine and stuff. And like, I don't like DMT doesn't work for me. Like, and this is where, this is where for me, psychedelics start to branch <clears throat> off in different directions because, you, you know, you can get mas mescaline as a, as a refined white powder mm -hmm. or you can get it as a cactus, right? Or I can get DMT as a refined white powder or I can get it as a ayahuasca vine, right? Mm -hmm. 
I don't feel like the human tampering to turn it into a refined white powder is doing any favours to it at all. Do you think it's also the way that you use it, though? Mm. With that, it, it has that it's connotation. Coming from pure there, it's, yeah. Rather than coming from a lab. Yeah. It's, it's tapping, in, like we're trying to tap into your soul here, we're trying to tap into what makes us part of this earth. And by taking the powders and by taking the the actual elements itself is not the best way, but getting it from the earth and from the sources where yeah. the soul gets opened. Ex exactly that. Like if, if I if I put my if I put my my psychedelic hat on for a moment, um, Mother Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a mother. It's a it's got a female energy. It's got a female spirit to it. And if you take the D DMT out of the vine and you make it a white powder, you take the soul away of it. Mm -hmm. Like the and it. And it, it I, I don't exactly know how to explain it, but it's not the same thing, right? What we're doing is we're going, well, what we want out of this particular plant for this effect is the dimethyltryptamine. So we're humanizing this psychedelic experience by refining it. Yeah. Now, white flour, sugar, anytime you refine something to a white powder, almost always it's gonna be bad for you, especially in excess, right? I've, I've smoked DMT a few times and I've never found it particularly pleasant. And I've always come out of the other side feeling like confused and overwhelmed. Whereas with, mm -hmm. with anything that was natural truffles or mushrooms or ayahuasca or mes or uh, San Pedro mescaline, it feels like it, it like takes you and brings you in. And it's not pleasant, like you feel sick and you feel dizzy and you feel mm -hmm. like you cramp and you, you're yawning constantly, you wanna cry and you wanna laugh. And like it's a constant roller coaster of emotions, but you, you move into the ayahuasca space and then when you're in the depth of it, it is incredibly powerful, intense and overwhelming to the point where you like, especially when the, when the DMT is strong in the mix, you don't feel your body, you feel separate from it, right? Mm -hmm. But then when you're coming back out the other side, it's like, you, it's like you walk up a mountain, you get to the peak and then you walk back down the other side. Like there's no victory in flying the helicopter to the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. Right, that's what DMT feels like to me. It feels like a bungee jump into the chaos mm -hmm. that is ayahuasca. And what I need to make sense of that chaos is the journey up the mountain, the journey back down, right? So that for me is why I always went to, like I've been to Peru, I've been to Indian reservations in California, Indian Canyon. You remember, um, you remember Wheatsey? He was a cut man for the UFC. Yes. Yeah, he was a shaman. He, he was a shaman. I had an, an incredible experience. I've got goosebumps thinking about thinking it. About I saw that. Yeah. I got an incredible experience with him. Did he just take him. you to uh, California? And I went to the to the Indian reservation to meet him, um, and and I did a ceremony with the tribe. And this was a very different thing because ayahuasca was always at night in a, a ceremonial hut a Malacca, Um and it was always done with one shaman and a small group of people. That was always my experience, whether I did it in Peru or Utah or Vegas or wherever, I, always the same kind of setup. Indian Canyon, there were 40 people in the ceremony. The youngest person that drank ayahuasca was six and everyone was there all day. And at night we did a sweat lodge and the whole thing was compounded even more. Me and Kyle Kingsbury, it was the two of us together did it. And like even just the sweat lodge, the process of going through that. And that was like suffering. Like we did mm. three lots of 15 minutes and they took these massive volcanic rocks. There were, there were nine volcanic rocks and they dug a pit and they put them in the pit and they built a massive fire over it. And then Wheatsy would come out with his big, uh, big set of clamps and he'd get three of these rocks and take them into, the, into this tent that he'd mm. built. And the, the floor was covered in like herbs and branches and stuff. And, three rocks glowing like volcanic rocks in the middle and then there's like six or eight of us sat around and then you just chuck water on the whole place filled up with steam and then like the ayahuasca starts coming back in again and i'm like curled up on the floor like sweating and shaking in my underwear and smelling these herbs and like trying to just stay in there yeah. and it was like 15 minutes five minutes out in the in the moonlight 15 minutes you bring three more volcanic rocks in so it gets hotter each time and we did we did 45 minutes and I came out feeling like I was, I was extraterrestrial. And is this like a situation where you can say, I've had enough, I want to stay out? Or would nobody oh, yeah. do that? No, I mean, yeah, nobody. but it, but it was like, I, I, especially when it, came to a, when it came to shamans, like you don't always know what shaman's gonna be leading the ceremony, but you, you can feel whether you trust them or not straight away. Mm -hmm. I've left ceremonies halfway through because I didn't trust the guy that was running it. But with Wheatsy, and, and he never, he never called himself a shaman. He just said he was his friends with the spirits. Yep. He's just, I'm gonna guide you. I'm not, I'm not here to lead you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you along the way. 
So I trusted him and I just, I just, whatever he says, we're going to do this because I want the authentic experience that he's going to lead me through. And it was, it was incredible. It was, it was just, it was different to anything I'd ever experienced. Like normally you've got the shaman and they sing and they'll maybe play an instrument, but maybe not. Sometimes it's complete darkness. Sometimes there's a candle lit, but this one, it was like, it was daylight in a clearing in a forest. And these people playing drums and blowing horns. And there was a guy came and stood behind me playing a didgeridoo at one point, or at least, I, <laughs> at least I think there was a guy behind me playing a didgeridoo. But like, like all of these different senses, even just the light, when your eyes are completely dilated, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It was a, it was a very, very intense day. But we were there all day into you know early hours of the next morning. It seems like Sahan we're going to have to. Like the more I hear people talking about it. <sighs> the soul, man, I, I need to fix the soul. It's it's not in a good place. And listening to you speak that, I'm like, this 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 seems like something can actually mm. tap into me and make me feel better going into a fight. For sure, uh, for sure. I, and you know, as long as you've got the right the right place, the right guide. I went to the same place in Peru twice, and the first time was was groundbreaking for me. But the second time was odd because I felt a little bit disjointed when I first arrived. And within a few days of being there, I'd, I'd started to chat with this, this kid that was there. He'd, he'd come out, he was living in one of the private, uh, like the private huts, the tambos in the forest. He'd been segregated from the group and he was clearly struggling with a lot of stuff internally, mm -hmm. like body dysmorphia, body image, confidence, et cetera, et cetera. And he was a, a smart, good looking, talented kid. He just had this mad perception of himself that was very, very different from anything anybody else could see, right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until a week in that I, real, I realized why I was there. And he was telling me, it always gets me, it makes me a bit weird, feel a bit. <clears throat> he was, <clears throat> he was gonna kill himself. And he'd watched a, a Joe Rogan podcast. <clears throat> Dear thing, man. A Joe Rogan podcast with this guy talking about ayahuasca. <laughs> And he was like, uh, he was like, I think this is my last option. I'm gonna go to Peru to try this thing that this guy's talking about. Um, and, he, and he got to Peru and he was there for a month and he was telling me this story. And then it turned out that I was the guy that was talking about ayahuasca on the ceremony and on the, the podcast. The guy that, that, and he that didn't know that it was me. <laughs> Like, uh, like, like he came out there to do this, this, have this experience because he felt like it was going to save his life. And, and he had no idea that I was going to be there when he arrived. And I didn't know that he was there for that reason. And, and did he make the connection when he heard your voice or? No, we were talking for a while. And he was talking, he was talking about this podcast that he listened to and Joe Rogan talking about this guy talking about ayahuasca and stuff. And I'm like, like, yeah, that's, and that's... I had a friend with me at the time and he was like, that's. That's him. That was your plan to be there for that guy? No, I had no idea he was going to no, be there. I was the, going there. In the, in the bigger universe? In the bigger, plan, yeah. You, you, you should have been there for that it, guy. That's what it felt like. That's why you were that's there. That's what it felt like. Because that's how, wow. going back to, like I say, all the way back to this passage in Bisbing's book, reading that, you can tell that you believe that this is probably all joined up somehow. Yeah. And that's amazing that, like, I know. that's pretty... Like, I just, I, I just, I remember leaving the first, the first time and, 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 Pretty powerful, eh? Yeah, yeah. Like there, there was another fight at Nico Shipshack. He fought in the UFC for a period of time. He trained with us at Rough House, and he was always quite a, like an energetic, but quite a chaotic person. Never really fully stuck to uh, to his training in MMA. Was a you know a bit drifted off every now and then. And and I remember I remember bumping into him a couple of years after he'd, he'd retired from mixed martial arts, and I, and having a conversation about ayahuasca, and, and and I remember saying to him, "What was the feeling coming out of it on the other side?" And he just paused for a second. This was actually in, in the changing rooms at like Ultimate Challenge or something, one of the shows in London, a bit mm -hmm. of a chaotic space. And I'm just like, just for a moment, just this, this peace came over him and he looked me dead in the eyes and he went, I just know that everything's gonna be all right. And straight away I was like, God, I want that feeling. Mm -hmm. I wanna feel everything's gonna be all right. Like, I don't know what's mm -hmm. gonna be all right, but mm -hmm. I just, I want that peace that you've got. So like that was the first time I, and I'd, I'd been using mushrooms quite a lot. Mike Danzig got me into psilocybin in quite a big way, but it wasn't until Nick just said that sentence. And I'm like, whatever he's had that experience, I, I feel like I need to connect with that. Maybe you're having that same feeling having, right like, now. I'm, it, it, it's a weird, like see when you started speaking there about that, this room went. I could tell it was just you when he's saying that. You were like, yeah, I, I, it's, 
this is a this is one of these moments in my life which is probably what you're having you had in that quick chaotic changing room. Yeah. I'm having that right now, thinking like I want to feel that. Yeah. I want I want to feel like everyone's going to be all right. This is a path you're meant to be on. So we I, can be very I, guilty of leading chaotic I'm, I'm lives ourselves as well. Like easily fall into a path or, or into a trap of letting your fit again like we said that fighter persona bleed into your personal life bleed into your private life maybe even and you start doing things you shouldn't be doing it's very easy mm. to start doing that so this definitely sounds like something especially you've got so many young guys are they're all over the place aren't they so it definitely sounds like something i'm nice. per- Aye, we're going to have to explore we, 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 this, we I think. Like I, I, yeah. I'm going past, I think, it's, that's nailed it for me because it's been something I've been thinking about for a while. I've been quite scared of mushrooms, if mm-hmm. I'm honest. Mm-hmm. Any type of... I'm, I'm I've, I've been scared of them. I've been scared to dip my toe. I took and LSD I'm, and it was horrible. Yeah. It was minging. And, I, and it was just yeah. such a dark... And honestly, I, I know you are laughing, right? But it was gruesome. Yeah. It really it, was yeah. bad. Eh? And it's, I was quite... No very well for quite a while after it. And the whole idea of anything psychedelic since has just been like, nah, nah, Mm. it was quite dark when I did that before. Like, there was a lot of things I've seen that I kind of had tricked myself into believing they hadn't even happened. Yeah. And that's what worries me about it. Like, are those things going to cut? Because I want to see some of them again. So are those going to reappear? See, that, that that is the challenge, is like, you, you don't you don't always get what you want, but you're always going to get what you need from psychedelics. And mm-hmm. sometimes that process is not going to be pleasant to go through. But then what I will say is LSD. It's a chemical, right? I know it's it lysergic acid, right? It was like, and and I, I don't as far as the psychedelics go, LSD is not not too bad as far as as far as like the refinement goes. I don't think, mm-hmm. but it's still on that end of the spectrum. Whereas for me, the the organic stuff, mushrooms, truffles, ayahuasca. Like even even to start with something quite uh, quite manageable, something like like mescaline, like mm-hmm. San Pedro or Peruvian torch or peyote is is mescaline. Like that's a very different thing. The reason why they call it San Pedro is Saint Peter. It's like mm-hmm. it opens the gates of heaven. Is what the Spaniards said when they were conquering South America. That was why it has a, a, a Spanish name. Mm-hmm. But it, it that's a very different thing. Like I, the first time I did that, I, I had I had a, a big dose. And I wrapped myself up in a in a hammock and waited for it to to come on. I'm like, okay, I can feel it coming on now. I'm gonna go for a little walk through the forest. So, and and with, this is the Amazon, like, and I can you can hear jaguars at night. So you've got to be kind of careful where you're walking. I love how you just say the forest, and it's like, it's just the Amazon. Yeah, but it, <laughs> but it was it's, it's weird because it's like it, it becomes like your living environment, so you don't feel too disconnected from it. Mm-hmm. Like 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 at night, it's deafening the amount of noise, the amount of creatures and critters and stuff. But then jaguars fighting and roaring is terrifying. Mm. Uh, you know, you, but like you're walking through it, you're walking through the 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 the, the forest, the jungle, with this mas- mescaline in your system, and you're like, I understand why they called it the key to the gates of heaven, because mm-hmm. like everything's like there's there's a glow, the trees are breathing, you feel connected to everything. Like it's a very very overwhelming feeling, but it, it's not going to regress you into any kind of difficult. Mm-hmm. stuff that you have to process that's the difference between mescaline and ayahuasca ayahuasca will take you there ayahuasca will 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 show you things that you have to face because they're holding you back it's not it's not a pleasant thing to. sometimes it's I've not been kinda, i'll be honest i've been looking to to meet people to talk to about this and it's a hard subject to talk to some people about like um I must be fucking driving my partner up the wall now with some of the stuff that, like, I fought there on the 24th of August. I've not been in the gym since. I haven't even wanted to go. I've, I, I trained yesterday just at, like, my local, what would you call that? Fitness gym. Aye, local commercial gym. I'm going to go back later on. My daughter's got a gymnastics class next door, and I just go in and train. And yesterday was the sort of first time I thought, ah, maybe I will go back to the gym. But there's been other things happening in my life. The, the last four weeks, has been, there's some stuff I've told the guys, and I'm quite close, especially with Paul, but some just fucking mad, unex, not unexplainable, it is explainable, but things that I just thought had gone away. And I've, and I've been sort of looking for a cure to this because it's knowing the other things. Mm. It's knowing any of the... It's no one going out for drinks. It's no for any party, and it's no anything like that. And I'm needing something to sort of put a stop to this stuff because it's it keeps popping up, and it always pops up at the same time. I have a great moment, like you have a, a good fight and win, 
and then boom, it's like crash. And it's when the crash comes, all these doors open again and go, ah, oh, remember this, remember this. So you're the second person only a week who's telling me it's a medicine, it's gonna make you better. I have to start believing and take the next jump and just go, fuck it, I'm gonna go for it. Yeah, what, uh, what, what I will say though, and, and it, it is a medicine, but, but that isn't gonna make you better. Mm. It won't. What it will do is it will show you the direction that you have to move in mm -hmm. to make yourself better. That's fine with me. You know, I can do that. That's, I that's can do that. Part. Yeah. <laughs> you still have to. You have still have to do the. You got to do the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like like just, just because someone hands me a map to London, it doesn't mean I'm going to end up in London if I don't mm -hmm. follow the map. Right? Uh, it's not a magic. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So like like you you have to keep yourself connected to it all the time. You have to keep reminding yourself like meditate, meditate all the time, and 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 meditation can be whatever you want. It could be going to the gym on a treadmill or whatever. Mm -hmm. But like just to be reconnected connecting with that space all the time and regrounding yourself. And I feel like I'm better at that now. I feel like it's given me the ability to manage myself in times when I feel like I'm struggling to manage myself. Has that taken a lot of time and effort though? Or did I, it, did I, I, it... I think it has, but, it, but not nearly as much time and effort as it would take if I hadn't dealt mm -hmm. with it. So it well follows me forever. It? So right. I, look, I, I do meditation every single morning and it's not because I want this, I want what I had I want that meditation experience that I've had maybe six years ago when I was like, oh, you come out of your meditation, you're like, that was amazing. And it's very, very hard to repeat it again. And that's what I'm trying to get. And that's why I do it every single day mm. for 20, to an hour, 20 minutes to an hour, every single day without fail. And I want that that I can't get. Mm. And there's times where it'll just kind of creep in a wee bit and then it'll just be taken away again. Yeah. And that's, that's what I'm always looking for, to try yeah. and get, get in that space and try and, as we're saying, like try and heal, heal your soul. Mm. See, I, I developed like I developed techniques for visualization to go with my meditation, because when I realised that meditation isn't sitting in, in silence and trying to switch your brain off, because mm -hmm. that's so difficult to do. If I give myself a direction, and like when I was at university, I did I did some meditation courses which taught bre uh, breathing rhythms, which I find quite useful. But even so, like focusing on my breathing still doesn't mean that there's a conversation in my head yep. that's going on, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas, like. De dealing with anxiety in a training camp was a, another was something that I always needed to, needed a, a solution for. I had two ways of doing it, and they were both meditations. One, if I was if I was already doing visualization of the fight, and a negative image popped up, getting cracked with a shot, getting hurt, getting tangled up in a submission, I would I would visualize myself in this like this like cellar, this like basement with a roaring fire, and I would cut that scene out of the film and I would throw it into the fire and I would stitch the film back together and I would keep it playing. And it was my way of removing that negative thought. You are direct, right? It. Yeah, I would just, I'd literally, I would, I would then, I'd be in a film room with a fire and I'd just take that piece out and get rid of it. And another one, and, and I, for whatever reason, whenever I do this, I still do the meditation starting in my bedroom at my parents' house. <laughs> That's how long I've been doing it. So I start, I'm sitting on the floor in my bedroom in my parents' house. Then I zoom out and I can see the room. Then I zoom out and I can see the house. And I keep doing this zoom out until I'm so far away from Earth that I'm like, all my problems are on that little tiny dot there. No, and nobody skill. else on that dot's really that bothered about my problems. So how bad can they really be? Mm -hmm. And I would take myself out of that. I'd go all the way out to that, to the, as far as I could. And then I'd go back in. And I'd take that confidence back into my body, into that room. And I used that. I used to use that a lot of time, a lot of, like most days really, if I was struggling, especially when I got close to a fight and I'm like, oh, I'm feeling anxiety. I'm like, let me just put it all into perspective. Mm. And if I can't put it into perspective, let me throw it in the fire. You know, and if I can't throw it in the fire, if it keeps following me around, I've got a glass jar and I put it on a shelf in my mind. And that's another weird visualization. I've got a shelf full of it's shit It's funny in my you mind. say the shelf. <laughs> so I do the, it's in a box in the attic and just more stuff gets added and it goes further and further at the back. And that's it. Um, I went to therapy a couple of times and this is my partner, she says this all, as well. She's like, the times you've went and done this, you've actually got worse. Mm. It's like you've went away into those boxes, pulled them at the front, opened them back up again. And it was all fine away at the back when you weren't thinking about it. It's, it's strange that there's those parallels there with the, the jar and the shelf, like yeah. it's far away for you. And that's how I look at some of these things as well. They're just miles away. Like if you've probably got stuff up in your attic right now that oh, it's right at the back, I'm not going to bother going and getting it. It's just... I don't know, I just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> but, so <laughs> yeah, and, which is interesting. And it's interesting that the visual, the visualization for you is in a box in mm -hmm. the attic in the and back. It, and it kind of get it. You can't see it, you no. can't think about it, and it's mm. so far away that you can't access it. Couldn't even it. get it, stuff's piled up on top of it, couldn't get to it if you wanted to. 
that's how I look at it all the time. And it's just further, and then new things happen in your life, and boxes get closer to the ladder, don't they? Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. can't, you, you couldn't even get in and climb over it. You'd have to take everything out. So there's no even, you wouldn't even bother doing that, would you? Yeah. And if you moved house, you'd just have to get a skip and bin it all, wouldn't you? But <laughs> and that's where you start, right? Aye. That's where you start. You, you get the box out and you don't put it back in the attic. Aye. And then that's when the problems start. Though. Yeah. That's, when, <laughs> that's when you start letting things out of the box that you thought were gone forever. Yeah. But no, this is a... The well, thing is, they're influencing you anyway. Can I ask a wee question? So obviously this is a very personal subject. How does this translate for you as a coach, obviously, for Veronica? How does this translate to helping someone else with this sort of thing? Um, I, I, think, I think I have, I have the... I have the tools that I can pass on. Like, I don't, I don't need someone to, like, I'm not gonna go, all right, well, let's send you to Peru for two weeks and have all these experiences. What I can do is I can tell you what I got from these experiences and you can put them into practice. And, and you know, a lot of people can, you know, a lot of people don't have the same kind of roadblocks that I was working through with some things and same thing with you, right? Like we might deal with the same thing in a very, very different way because we perceive the blocks and the blockages as different things. But if I can show the path through to somebody else, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily have to, they don't necessarily have to draw the map themselves. They can follow my path. Mm -hmm. So like, that's why I don't mind talking about these things, right? Because like, you've all seen me get knocked out and conscious in, in, on TV. Like, it don't get much worse. You know what I mean? Like, no. you, you, you know, like, so I don't really, I don't really feel like I have to kind of reserve anything. But then you speaking about it, as you said about on the Joe Rogan podcast and then having that experience in Peru, like, if you didn't speak about it, then you wouldn't have been to that point. So it makes sense to speak about it and make it actually like this, having this moment with each other. Yeah, which is why I'm, I'm kind of starting to a little bit, just kind of talk about like the autistic spectrum a little bit more because like my mum and my sister do incredible work with, with children. They both have a degree in childcare, child psychology. They it's deal tough with job. It, incredibly tough. Like I don't know, I wouldn't have the strength to do the jobs that they mm -hmm. do and to tell me some of the tragic things that they tell me. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do see is them having such a positive influence on so many people's lives by being, uh, you know, attentive and caring and open to the problems that they're experiencing, even though it's not a problem that, that they can comprehend themselves because they're not dealing with the same, the same neurodivergence. Um, and I'm, I'm going through the process of looking at diagnoses and th those kind of things, but... For yourself? Yeah. Do you yeah. feel that would change anything? I don't. I don't know. To, I don't. I don't really know. I'm kind of, that's why I'm kind of battling it a little bit. Doesn't it seem to me like you trust the doctors anyway? I don't. I just, well, <laughs> it seems like you've. Worked yeah, you've already. You've, you've, you know what you need to know. You, you've. Yeah, I, I just. I don't know whether. Journey. I don't know whether, and it might sound stupid. I don't know whether a bit of paper would make me feel more trusting of my own instincts. But mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. like if my mum says something, I trust my mum. I, I know her qualifications. Um, but I'm, I'm also aware that like. I've been I've been masking since I was a little kid, mm -hmm. right? And I remember watching this documentary about about people on the spectrum, and they took I think there were six girls, and they put them into this speed dating room, and the guys that they were speed dating had to guess which one of the girls was autistic, and they they all guessed wrong, but the one thing that they all got wrong is that all the girls were autistic, and girls are very very good multitasking; yeah, they're able to it. mask mm -hmm. a lot better than guys, but. <clears throat> I think there are a lot of guys that can mask and they're not given the credit that they can mask. Like I don't realize sometimes when I'm masking. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, and I notice it more weirdly. I notice it like when I'm in airports and I'm stressed and like I can't, I can't make eye contact with Veronica because I, I, I can't, it's just don't it's fucking look much. at me, you know what I mean? I have to, but it, like it, it's in hindsight that I'm looking, I'm watching myself go through the first week at school, breaking out in eggs more all over my body and being, incredibly stressed That's or stressed, thanks. yeah or like i couldn't i couldn't eat lunch in us in the school in the in the hall at school because i could hear every person in the room eating i can hear mm -hmm. every single knife and fork ding ding you know and it, and it's like all these things like at the time i didn't realize they were getting on top of me like they were weren't get, were getting on other people do you know what i mean so mm -hmm. it's like i've always wanted to write a book called my pet reptile which would be a book that i'm writing to myself as a as a a, a young teenager mm -hmm. And the point, the point of the book would be, look, this is how you're feeling right now. Some, type, some days you're gonna feel angry, some days you're gonna feel sad, some days you're gonna feel depressed. You've got different parts of your brain pulling you in different directions. You've got different people around you telling you different things. Like, and, it, and it basically would be an instruction booklet for me to know myself quicker than I, than I do now, right? Know myself when I'm 18 instead of when I'm 40.
for example, you know? So like that kind of goes back to your question, like how, like the, the benefit of me speaking about it is that other people can benefit without going through the same processes and spending so much of their life, not really fully understanding who they are as a person and what they're up against. A bit lost. That's yeah. the feeling, eh? It's, <laughs> it's one of the great things about martial arts. Aye. You're in a room where the vast majority of these people probably have all the same feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, and listening to you talk, like I'm having like pretty much the same childhood as well. Like, like when your partner maybe it's too loud, and you're eating the exact same thing. Yeah, that's called you're misophonia. Eating, you know? like, you're eating it's the exact same thing, or like, they're j like they're, there's just simple things where you like you can't look at them because you're like, I feel like I'm just like I'm either going to explode. Or I'm going to cry. Like these are the, all these things, and it's good to hear somebody else talk about them. Mm -hmm. And it's like there's maybe like somebody out there just listening to this, not an MMA fighter, just a guy. Just, I just struggle in my life, and they're like, yeah, ah, right. So it's not just me. Uh, everybody feels like this, or not everybody, but there's, there's a select, there's, there's, there's a select yeah. group of people who are on this spectrum who feel like that. See, Absolutely beautiful. I, I feel fortunate that I found mixed martial arts and I was able to make a career out of it because mm. it's allowed me to be more forgiven of myself. Like I think to myself, okay, think about think about m me in another person's body, but I have to do a normal job. I get up and I go Oof. to a job nine o'clock. I'm there till five o'clock. Like I, I think I can I can see why so many people get into drinking and violence and mm -hmm. depression and like Paddy Pimlet's talking about it so much, the amount of like young men, like late thirties and stuff. And I see this at the gym constantly. Like they, they get to a point where all of a sudden it's like, it's like, it's like, okay, well, may, maybe my hopes and dreams are not going to come to fruition. Yeah, they wrap up. Right. I, I was talking I just to a, my drone. I was talking to yeah. a, like a, a worker. Bee. There's a friend of mine. He's, he's quite a good friend of mine, but he does all the, like he goes and does his shopping at Costco on this day and he washes his car on this day and he, and he, and I'm like, sounds like hell. He, and he says, why can you not just relax a bit and be more like, I'm like, mate, I don't know where lie. I'd probably rather jump off the bridge than do that. Mm -hmm. Like, it just sounds that fucking horrible. And I know, and I said it out loud only like last weekend and he was mortified. He's like, that's a normal life. I'm like, no, for me, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. It's, it sounds like honestly the worst. I had an office job once. I lasted for four days. Mm -hmm. I was like, what the fuck are people doing? Right. I'd never had one before. I was like in my twenties. And you I was like, what? See, the thing is, you still need day people in life. Uh, it's like, you do. Loads of different I was like, how do they do this? this? How do they do it? How do they sit there for like four days? And you've got to watch what you say and you, you go for lunch. You don't just go and eat when you want. Mm. They tell you when you can. I couldn't yeah. believe yeah. any of this. Crazy. And I know it's so people are going to be watching this like, what? Of course. These guys are not bags. <laughs> but I just couldn't. Mm -hmm. I was, I was just like, no, I just no got in the car and went home. Mm. Like, ah, fuck this, I'm away. Yeah. So it's, aye, it's just, there's been quite eye opening. <laughs> aye, it's been, it's been like, some podcast, but some will be a bit nicer. Lego. We oh, have to speak yeah. So, have you got anything, have you got something, like a piece, which is like the holy grail for you, or is there a piece out there that you're like, ah, oh, I need this? The, the most the most valuable piece to me in my collection was the original Brickbeard Captain that came with the original pirate ship, mm -hmm. right? So that came out, I was I think I was five when that pirate ship came out. Red and white sails. Mm -hmm. It was 50 pounds. My parents couldn't afford it. So my grandparents and everybody all chipped in and got this thing. And it is, I mean, it's, it's built up in my office now. It's, it's, it's pristine. I, I, I just love it because because I have just so many good memories associated with that particular thing. But like the captain, mm -hmm. he was the first thing I saw in the, the pirate I'm collection. Am I saying they brought out the, the massive figure in they that? Did. They did. I'm going to get that. that. I'm going to have to you get it. No, I've not got him yet, no. But that's that. If when I get a Lego tattoo, it will be that captain. Yep. Yeah, because it's, it's just... And that, I remember getting that ship. I didn't think I was going to get it because it was so expensive. I fell asleep early on Christmas Day because of the excitement. My dad spent mm. the rest of Christmas evening building the boat. And then the next morning, and we had this glass dining room table in our house in front of the, the patio doors. And I remember waking up the next morning, boxing it and going downstairs and this pirate ship was just sitting on this glass table and it looked like it was on a still sea. You know what I mean? It's just mm -hmm. like sitting there, I can see the reflection in it. And I'm just, it just took my breath away. Yep. It was just, it was, it was, it, it took my, my, my imagination in a hundred different directions at the same time. I loved it. I loved it so much. So I would say probably that the captain is the most precious. Yep, but that's... like, like I have, I have a lot of really, really old sets from when I was very, very young, very young. And still got them now. I've still got everything. I've kept everything from mm. my my kids as well. Like I, I remember building the 
it's like a little submarine that's got. I know it's not a spe- it's not a special, but it's special to me because me and him sat and built it. Do you know what I mean? And it's got the extending arms and things like that. And then I remember him saying, "What will we do with it?" Now I went. Take it apart, build whatever you want. Mm. And that's it. I've never been into like, you know, Lego movie where his dad glues the bricks and like, how can you do this? That's always been, uh, it wasn't until I had him. I used to be like that. Like, no, no, you don't take it apart. And then yeah. once I was like, ah, fuck it, take it. Do what you want. It says, for Turn me, it's it into the, what you want. For me, it's the moments of sitting with my daughter and building them. Like, mm-hmm. my daughter's 18 now. And like, this is one of the, one of the things I talk about the podcast is how it's breaking my heart that my my kids are leaving me. I had this I had this weird experience last weekend, the exact same thing. But it's these moments he's sitting down and building them and flipping through the book and like, and that's what makes Lego so special. Mm-hmm. Um, I had brought a few packs. I'm not sure if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, are you? A what? A Lord of the Rings fan? Oh, absolutely, of course. <laughs> so I had brought a few few packs for you, so uh, I'm not sure if you got them. No. Did you get the the actual Baradour and the I've got, Rivendell? I've got Helm's Deep. That's the only one of the Lord of the Rings that's ones That's one of the I've original got. ones. Yeah, that's the only so one I've got. they're yours, man. You can build them. Uh, These are for me? They're for you, man. Oh, man, you're a legend. This is like... Well, you're going to have to commentate tomorrow now because I'm going to be sat in the room <laughs> doing these. Right, no, this, is, this is one of my favourite scenes in the whole movies. I love the, the Bridge of Casa Oh, it's so good you shall like, not pass. I know, it's, it's, um, and I'm Man, excited to see well what's, 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 what's going next for uh, the Hunt for Gollum. Man, these are so cool. That's really cool. So Thank I, you some, very much. Something to do. Um, That's really cool. Did you get Rivendell? I got Rivendell. Is it good? Is uh, it I've, I've not, I've not found the time because I want it to be a, a moment for me. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm trying, I'm trying to pin down all my kids. <clears throat> so like, I've got two girls, and I'm like, we need to do this together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, Lego, it's just for me, it's, it's moments, it's moments. And as a kid, as you were saying, you got that. Mm-hmm. Shit. It was a box I got, and that box was endless. You mm. could do anything with it. I remember I had the wee monkey figure, do you remember? Oh, yeah. I think you got it with the ship as well. Uh, That was one of my favourite, just this little monkey and all its legs moved. They were like arms and it just takes me back to a moment. But I'm very aware that you're a busy man. It's it's been uh, a pleasure talking to you, it really has. uh, I've been looking forward to this. This has been excellent. It's it's Friday morning, a day before the the PFL uh, as it happens in Glasgow. Um, And if you are interested in going to the PFL, hit the link. There are still tickets available. This uh, will be out for Friday night. So if you are looking to support some of that Scottish talent that we've been speaking and we've been been trying to push you to go for the last couple of weeks to show support for Scottish MMA, then make sure you get tickets. Hit the link in the the bio. And Dan, thank you so much. Dan, thanks so much. I really appreciate you, man. Thank you very much. Cheers.